Boy, we're gonna have a good house tonight. We have Raphael Cosette, mm, Duchess County, Poet Laureate. We've got Peter Ulian, Beacon, Poet Laureate. We've got Robert Milby, Poet Laureate, Orange County. We've got Terence Chiesa, he's just the Laureate. Yeah, man, this next gentleman, God, I love Robert. He seems to be such an anomaly. And yet, as we are just within the past half hour, so there are more of us. And there are. And there's almost a, an aspect within the context of physical, in, in, in physics, the discussion within mathematical equation, you don't have to sway nine billion people. You just have to probably mass maybe 8,000, 10,000. And surely there are more of those than we think of 10,000. That we have to make ourselves known, heard, eloquent, and demonstrate humanism. This soul that I'm bringing up as our feature, and I started to talk, I really like his work, and subsequently the collaboration of editing and putting it together became a hug of the sun that has stopped. And Father Robert Phelps is an extraordinary soul. And just to be more on script, this is funny. Robert Phelps is a soon-to-be 80-year-old Franciscan Capuchin friar and Catholic priest who grew up avoiding poetry like a head cold. <laughs> Taught to memorize poems in school, he did what he was told, but saw little value in knowing that under the spreading chestnut tree of village smithy stands. <laughs> he spent 40 years in the Pacific region as a missionary, with 26 years on the tiny island of Guam in the Western Pacific, and 14 more years in Hawaii. You should see this guy surf. Like a rock. <laughs> Rock on. It was on the island of Maui in 1991 that he wrote his first poem. While on a religious retreat, sitting in an empty house in the rain, forest surrounded, he remembers, by screaming peacocks, and he has been at it ever since. Father Bob is the author of two chat books published by Finishing Line Press, Ever and Point of View and the full-length book entitled In the Hug of the Sun That Has Stopped, published by Lion Auto Music Publishing Company. He has copies for sale of each of the three works tonight, ever in point of view. I'm not going into prices. You can discuss with that him later. His poetry has been pu published in several journals, such as Nassau Review, Evenshaw Review, Rua, and Concrete Wolf, and locally in Conogram and Waymark. It gives me an absolute pleasure. This is going to be a ball. Grace us, sir. The lights are blinding me. Okay. No, they're not. Uh, could I ask you a favor uh, uh, before I begin tonight? Uh, would you all take out your wallets? Oh, I'm sorry. It's another favor. Another favor I want from you is that uh, in between the poems that I share with you, I'd like to ask if there's uh, no booing or clapping or anything like that. Uh, you can save all your venom for when I'm done. All right. Uh, if, uh, however, if uh, if it's too quiet and you want to lay your heads down on the table and just you know take a nap, it's fine with me too. That's okay. Right. Thank you. The first poem is a poem called, can everybody hear me clearly? Yes. Yes. The first poem is a poem called Point of View. It's a title poem for one of the chapbooks here. Against the ice blue morning sky at the corner of Verplank and 9D, a taut telephone wire from south to north. And on the wire in the very middle of this vision, a tiny sparrow alone, perched as still as a concrete wall, not moving, perched. Her eyes unblinking looked on as the cars processed to the light, waited for the green, and moved on north to the bridge or south to Main Street, busy with places to go. 
unimportant day stuffers to keep making sense and to give a rhythm to the humdrum of life. But she, on that wire alone, crowned the queen of the intersection, overlooked her fiefdom, and pitied her poor subjects in the moving cars below for their inability to fly. This is called Winter Weekends in Beacon, New York. I hope you're not going to be mad with this. Idea. <laughs> the young and beautiful couples, refugees from the dark city, on weekends amble arm in arm along the boulevard of bubbles in Beacon. It's cramped parking lots jammed with their Audis and Beamers. Somehow they all look alike, thin, in their dark blue woolen coats and leggings or turtlenecks and jeans, GQ and Vogue, as they rummage through the tired old town seeking that perfect akuma for their walk-ups in the village or rent-controlled Shangri-Las in Chelsea. Thick-necked, red-faced burgers of beacon. We watch them on parade as they pretend they are alone or somehow at home in this bricked-out old town that punches holes in abandoned brick factories, windows them up, and creates wondrous eateries, airsats, hot cuisine for these urban ingenues. This is called Labor Day in Beacon. Once again, the morning sun delineates the borders of old Beacon, knuckled brick buildings squat since Grover Cleveland, passively greet the newness of this Labor Day morning. Peeking through the alleys and stained glass lattices that the sun makes of aging leaves, Beacon is being born again. The lonely oversized bell towering over the Edwardian brick firehouse on East Main is shadow as it silhouettes the scream of a morning sky. A thick calved man in Bermuda shorts with a blue t-shirt that exclaims Mets walks his dog and his dog walks him. There's a silence here that's not an absence but a vanilla frosting covering the play of the early morning sun that squats up the street and peeks through backyards and hanging wash and shouts that God loves Beacon, its folks, its squirrels and its children its dogs and cats, and the little woman in a beaten baseball cap pruning free the weeds in her pinched garden on Liberty Avenue. This is called Shopping Cart Man. Past the shadowed parking lot, he shadow trundles. Hidden shadow dogs bark at his heels. He pushes a stolen grocery cart with spinning front wheels filled with his life, his art, his pain in bundles. Rags of his journey, burnt things, bottles now empty that once numbed lips sucked, scarce remembered nirvana found a lifetime ago at the breast of his teenage mama. Disheveled Vietnam surplus jacket and a tear at the knee of his oversized jeans, his raiment. His sneakers torn where the canvas has pulled away from its rubber footings. In the cart, a gypsy caravan of plastic bags wild, icons of neighborhood marts, and women's pastel colored clothes sticking out like unruly hair. In his mad journey, there is no rest, no help from another. Although he is not looking, I fear he will suddenly know I am near and I'll be caught caring. And I daren't. Because strangely, I fear that he will me recognize and accuse me of being his brother. This is a new poem called Empathy. She slowly sipped her Heineken and stared for a moment at the shiny tavern's table before telling me that she suffered from morning migraines so severe that during them she feels dragged up the hill of the crucified 
and being there naturally begs the dying man to relieve her. And when he answers that her life is not about avoiding pain, but about gathering strength that wells up into the vessels of her heart, she can see better what a mustard seed of compassion for another can be. That there is no appreciable distance between suffering embraced and the embrace of another suffering. I, say, I served for 14 years in Hawaii uh, on the island of Oahu and on December 7th, 1991, uh, there was the um, commemoration of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941. And I was, I was in a parish called St. Elizabeth's in Aiea, which is right on Pearl Harbor. And uh, uh, the president came out, it was George H.W. Bush. But from the mainland uh, came hundreds, I, don't, I think there's probably only scores today, but there were 1991 hundreds of the veterans that were there when the Japanese attacked. This is called the 50th anniversary of Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1991, Return of the Survivors. Unsteady gait, bent over testimony to the gentle unkindness of the years, with outlandish aloha shirts, bought at an ABC store or at Sears a la Moana. They are here, white, bony, bow-legged, with their VFW caps bearing names of ships that are no more. They are here, these warriors, to their mystical Pacific Valhalla they have come, to once again bear their shields, now dead of rust, and to drink the bitter wine of memories hidden on a dairy farm in Wisconsin or hardware store in New Hampshire, forced now to the surface of the bay at Pearl. Please don't miss them because they're feeble, confused by the play of the enemy's tourist grandchildren whirling around them as the zeros whirled around them that Sunday morn. Look at their eyes, it's in their eyes. Can you see? The fire still white hot as they scurry for the wounded and man the outnumbered guns and pull up the overboard and still cry old men's tears for the dream dry stare in the eyes of the dead. I was in, uh, I spent six years working in uh, Suffolk County, a place called East Patchogue. And for my day off, I used to come in the train and then walk down towards NYU, down towards the Greenwich to the village uh, in Lower Manhattan. This is a poem called Walking in Lower Manhattan. Eyes down, I, I wade through the surf and accompany a thousand of the city's children running their turf. I wait for the white-lit walking man at 18th Street. Then with no apparent plan, we all dart, matadors at the enraged yellow fours, the city's taxis, the lords of traffic. Hawking their rage, they claim, cross too slowly and you'll be maimed. In a doorway of the Strand bookstore on 12th Street, a young man kisses a shy Asian girl on the cheek. And an old black woman blind sits against a building and with a poster writ too long, with letters too small, begs the folks to stop and see the sign on her lap and drop some conscience into her waiting cap. This is entitled, After the Grief. After the grief, we change our shoes. We step away to forget you, your laugh. Taboo now to speak how your incense smile filled our rooms. Now a callous and selfish thing we do, dragging you indecent back to the unmarked minefield. What will happen to us? What retribution losing you? I saw once a vase, and in the vase were dead roses. And it looked it was so incongruous, I remember that. Uh, I guess they just died and nobody changed the vase or anything, but they were all very dead. 
And, uh, uh, well, I'll, I'll just read the poem. In the vase. The metallic helium balloon says hugs and kisses and shines obscene, unwelcomed, among the elegantly dead roses grayed, belonging somewhere in a Victorian drawing room, I suppose. In mortis they pose, gentle, colors of phoenix feathers, as flowers, leaves, stems, contribute to something new, something unexpected. A hint of powder has found its way to cover all the death. And as the leaves contract, a loss of moisture, loss of confidence, modesty imposed by conditions, repentance for their former crimson arrogance, now clothed anew. Death now gestates imagination. New contractions. It's as if death has simply generated new life. A new way to be a rose. I was privileged to spend. Se uh, I, I shouldn't. I have two Capuchin brothers here. I don't want to tell them too much about my life. But I, <laughs> I, I, I was privileged to be in the British Isles a few times, and I love the uh, the British Museum. This is called the Gods in the British Museum. Why have you come? Why are you here peering around my corners and eons, polluting my sanctuaries with your faded jeans, sticking your double mint gum on my tombs? Are you looking for the cafeteria? Are you deaf to the wail, to the grieving, to the horses in battle? Can't you hear my music liturgical still in this cold and far place? Has no one ever told you your fathers bagpipe my soul up the gangplanks of their pirate ships. Sacramental of all my journeys, this beauty coaxed from millennial hands, now hung like dead chickens, the swords of my honor, with my gods lined up like dolls in Harrod's windows. Hear me in the silence of our cold display. You and your fathers have overrun even my time. You are the final barbarians. This is a this is a prayer poem. Uh, it was meant to be a prayer. A prayer. It's in. It's called praise. If the ocean was a tear, and all the sky but breath on a mirror. If all of history was only a rumor, and all accomplishment footnotes. If every memory was lost and all meaning incomprehensible, even then you are ineffable. You are the only radiance and you sweep all else away. Even then, only you. As a, a working in a parish, you, you get to know a lot of people who uh, become widowed. This is called the widow. When her friends see her, they sigh. Wizened and thin, a rehearsed smile and squinting Irish eyes, unfocused since he died. She gets around to see friends when she's up to it. Occasionally she's found in the afternoon sitting in church, hunched in anonymity, lip syncing her beads. When the 4 a.m. gray that suggests the sun will follow causes her mind to slip sideways, she is standing mute by his finished body once again. By him with whom she had slept most of the nights of her life. Love salted with tears. Half awake, she begins to weep again. The half-hearted tenant of an empty king-sized bed. These days, she waits. This is, uh, um, I, until a few months ago, I lived on Leonard Street, and uh, this is a real person. <laughs> it's called A Woman and a Dog on Leonard Street. Her face is old shoes. Gently leathered skin buttered by the wind that lopes across Leonard Street. 
Her rat gray hair pushes out under a winter cap with ear flaps that could be a man's, a predictable fixture in the liturgy of hours on Leonard. Two or three times a day, some in the most inclement weather, she walks her dog. He a mangy black and brown homely hound. She is real thin as the wind blows at her loose trousers and whispers a hint of how skeletal her legs. Probably 50, she could be 70. I pass her often and nod hello. She nods back, only a probable smile. It's hard not to notice the sadness in her face, like the heel of a hand that rubbed her eyes raw, some anonymous heartache. And I know this because of the quiet exclusivity between her and her mutt, a symbiotic union of walker and walked, feeder and fed, lover and beloved her eyes soft only for that dog. I wonder if walking him is the sum of her day, her life. I'll bet that old mutt keeps her as she him. When that mangy old fella is gone, who will walk her? I spent 26 years on an island 32 miles long and four to seven miles wide. There's near a place you can go that you can't look at the ocean because it's a very small island, Guam. And there's, they have one library and they call it the Nevis Flores Library after some lady named Nevis Flores. <laughs> they cut the funding for the library. Its outside walls bleed black tropical fungus no money to water blast and paint. It's become a mind slum. Schoolgirls come there only to pretty eye acne boys pretending to homework, but really posing peacock in early mating games. Libraries are ordained to be elegant in their Tinkerbell dust, but this one has been rusted out and abandoned as if its walls had been shelled in some subtle war a gaping hole open to the road passing by, dirty. And I saw a cockroach in Edwardian poetry reading right to left, obviously without a library card. <laughs> it has been said, you don't need books anymore. Just boot up and head for Google. All that passion, heroism, blood, consumptive pens in, grafty, in drafty garrets dreaming of flowered fields and yearning for freedom as they sat in their consumption and dying, alcoholics pounding on old Remingtons with Chesterfields hanging from dry lips, singing about lights brighter than the sun. Printed pages dog ear where ink has come from veins. Books to take you to wondrous and dark places where you can make promises to love and life and honor. Knowledge has been set upon by the new Huns, has been beaten and castrated. What remains is only information. This is called learning. I was seven in the woof and bellow of the big city and the glut of people walking with no faces. Hysterical horns, yellow taxis yelling at one another. Then I saw him, a sad man in a frayed coat with downcast eyes sitting on the sidewalk selling pencils, 10 cents a pencil. Why is that man selling pencils? I asked. Why does that man look so sad? Keep walking, said my mother. This is called James Dying. His red-fisted Irish face, a slight peeling, the dryness of his forehead, James silently receives oil from the priest. He is 99, and death for him is a sweet smell soon here. He will tell you that he has closed his hand, holding on to endings already his, that the break is gradual and doesn't jar. Death comes from the earth, says James, like a warmth that comes up from the linoleum floor of the nursing home into his feet and legs, 
caressing him. He'll tell you that the color of his death sways in the whiteness of the cotton curtains blowing in his room, exploding in the eastern morning sun like the frilly bleach of his baptismal dress back in 1916 when the water was poured over his red-fisted Irish baby face. He'll tell you with a Celtic grin about his first class ticket on the glory train and that on the final ride, he's only a wide-eyed passenger now. A simple, poetry called, uh, simple poem called Poetry. A hunger lives in the pores of the skin, hears what can't be heard, speaks beyond words, past meaning, into communion, not understood, but longed for, and embossed as a brand on every bone and sinew. When I was on Long Island, uh, Long Island has big highways now. As you know, it's got the LI, what is it? Long Island, LIE. It's got the northern one, the southern one, but there used to be only one called the Montauk Highway. And that's a side road now. And it's only two lanes, you know, one lane coming in. And uh, this probably is gonna prove my psychosis, but it's called Montauk Highway Madness. I find myself when driving, I admit, sneaking a peek into the windshields of cars coming the other way, as if seeking to find some sort of communion with the face in the opposing windshield. I'd like to pretend that the banality of the grimace or lifeless gaze of the oncoming motorist is merely a self-defense against her being exposed as a tragic, unrequited kite, unable to see her helios as the morning sun invades her easterly ride along the clouds of fog along Montauk Highway. I expect that every infant, after initial fright about being in the light and away from the tired out, warm and human waiting room, does a little jig, at least with his toes, to be free and open to possibility, even if the kid can't spell the word. And think about it. Much later, when the Department of Motor Vehicles says he is truly free, he chooses to give in to that fetal impulse again closes himself up and travels with only peaking knowledge of all other embryonic pilgrims inhabiting the Dream Avenue with him. <laughs> a few years ago, a few years ago, if you remember, in uh, there was a terrible murder in Charleston, South Carolina, nine black worshipers were shot and killed by a young man, but I think his name was Roof, last name was Roof. And um, I watched the arraignment, it was on television, and it was very, this is the poem. Charleston Courthouse. Behind a screen in the lit back room looking like the window of a microwave oven, a boy's face in a prison jumpsuit, vicious in Buster Brown hair, pushed up against the pane, and answered the judge's question monosyllabically. Do you understand these proceedings? Yes. An arraignment. The murders of nine black souls pouring over the word in a church that evil had aimed to silence and who had poured out their blood. Arraignments are dry affairs, but not today. The judge, no one ever remembered this happening before, invited the survivors, families of the dead, to speak to the blanched face of a killer. Most spoke to him, many in choke and sob, but they all told the same bell, I forgive you, I forgive you. The sun gleaming barrels of four gray South Carolina guns down by the harbor, fired 154 years back, had just been spiked. This is my last poem. I have no idea how long I've taken or short, but there's 20 poems, okay. This is called When I Read a Poem. When I read a poem, I'm not at all patient if it shuffles on and begins to cramp my eyes with its tedium or withdraws from language into pretty self-absorbed sketch. I curse its irrelevance and begin to look elsewhere. 
I don't need words at room temperature. I need to read words that grab me by my ears and push down my face into the soil of meaning. Locked autistic in the mind of the poet, waiting for eyes to become ears. For the tristine to complete the connection for which it was fashioned. It is the reader who completes, blesses, makes words mean the dream. It is the reader who canonizes the poem. The reader has become the fellow at the pub, the longed-for friend at the bar with beer and pretzels and Freundschaft. Thank you very much. You can brew it.